Because the reality is when I get to heaven, <laughs> Jesus is not going to say, hey, were you assemblies of God? Were you Baptist? Were you Methodist? Were you Presbyterian? The Roman Catholic Church made a mistake in trying to say that they were the sole authority. The Protestant churches, you and I, make a mistake in that we divide over anything. We will always be assembly of God. But we'll be kingdom of God first. One of the questions that I get asked when someone finds out um, that I'm a pastor or a Christian is a question along the lines of something like, oh, what religion are you? And I, like, I know what they're asking me, but the question reminds me of how absolutely far removed we are from the picture that God had or has for the church, capital C. Because what they're asking me isn't really, you know, what religion I am. My religions would be whether you're a, are you a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim. What they're really saying is they understand that there's been different groups or sects of Christianity. And what they're really asking me is, what flavor of Christianity are you? What particular foundational, you know, what's your unique look at? How do you view it? And I, and I tend to fight that question with stuff like, you know, I'm just, I follow Jesus. I'm a Christian. That's what I do. And I don't mind dis discussing that I'm full gospel or assemblies of God or whatever it is, but I, that should always be secondary to the primary. And the primary is that first and foremost, I'm a believer in Christ. Everything else is secondary. So we've been going through this series called CORE, January, February, and we took a break. And as the series is talking about what are some foundational or some really important things to or central or in the most part of things to who we are as a church. And we talked about being a church that's spirit-led. We build people up. We dream big. We, you know, God um, owns everything. We're stewards. We talked about we value people. This week, I want to really take one week to hit this, this value that is so huge to God, and it's this that we are a church that is kingdom-minded. That why we believe and why God has called us together, why we believe in Pentecostal truths, why we believe, I believe we're the best church around, period. I didn't, I'm not the only church, but I believe we're the best. But that being said, we'll work with people that are part of the kingdom of God, and we will build the kingdom of God, even at times when it comes at our own expense. Amen? Amen. One of the last statements that Jesus makes as he's going to give his life on a cross as he prays for his disciples. And then he says this, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them, what, may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And that's a huge statement. Because what it's saying is this. It's saying that although doctrine does matter, it's important what you believe, the world isn't going to get saved because we have really, really good theology and doctrine. And it is a saying that the world is going to see how much you hate sin. And because you see how much you hate sin, the world is going to believe. It's not even going to say, you know what, and they're going to see your, your style of worship and how much freedom you have in worship and how personal your worship is. And when they watch you do that, they're just going to say, man, I want some of that too. I want Jesus. Instead, So the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, clearly the one characteristic that would cause the world to identify us as his followers is what? 
how we love one another. Here's, here's what another verse says in John 13, 35. By this, all men will know you, my disciples, if you what? If you love one another. Like that's the, how do I know you're a disciple of Christ? I love one another. How do I know Jesus really came from God the Father? Because of how much unity we have as within the church. Anybody see a problem? Anybody? A couple people, maybe. I was reading uh, some commentaries this week. And one of the commentaries I read is by uh, an, an atheist. And the atheist took the Bible and he gave a commentary, and a commentary on this verse. So let me kind of read his comments as he, what this verse means to an atheist. Jesus prays that believers might all be one, thereby proving once and for all that nothing fails like prayer. This is the person we're trying to reach. Jesus Christ came for you. He died for you. His analysis of the church, capital C, the kingdom of God, is that, dude, you're nuts. There's so much division within the church that if you're trying to say, use this as an example for Christ's coming, I want none of that. He goes on with the commentary. Since Jesus' followers are divided and have always been divided in a legion of conflicting sects, there's no reason to believe that his dad sent him according to Jesus' own test. Now, we understand what the deal really is. We understand that God gives us a freedom. Jesus also prays that all people come to him but all people don't because we have individual personalities and rights and God gives us that freedom, that choice. And so we understand that really the, the weight falls on whom? It falls on you and, and me. It's, it's, it's our responsibility to be one in unity with the kingdom of God. It, it falls on us to fulfill what Jesus calls us to do, to be in unity in the midst of diversity. Let me just kind of go this morning through almost this, I don't know, this historical narrative, if I will. And so if you have notes, I didn't put, you know, point one, point two, point three, because I think that as we go forward, and maybe there's some stuff that God speaks to you about as we go through this, but I'm going to go through a lot of kind of history. Um, if you're a history buff, I have some great resources you can study for yourself, but just the same. The history of the church starts with something like this. In the Bible, there's two types of churches that are mentioned. There's C, church, capital C, and, and those words are used stuff like the bride, the body of Christ, the church of the firstborn, the flock of God, God's building, daughter of Zion. In other words, the Bible describes Jesus' kingdom, the church, capital C, united in him, all together, the bride of Christ, one, capital C, the church. But the Bible also describes a lot of small Cs. For example, in the Great Commission, people go out and they're reaching people. And so the first three chapters of Revelation describe uh, different churches, whether it be Philadelphia or Antioch or Philippi or Greece or Tyre or Corinth was different than the church in Thessalonica. They dealt with different issues. And so you may, maybe Corinth was more Pentecostal or more spirit-filled or whatever you might want to call it. And Thess Thessalonica had their other issues that they were dealing with. So they were different. They were part of B, the, the capital C, capital church, but they're also small C, individual churches, individual leaders, unique. We see stuff like Rome. Rome had their own stuff, that their own uniqueness about the churches in Rome, as opposed to the churches in Ephesus. Individual leaders, individual deacons, individual elders over each of these churches, and, and yet you see this kind of, at least to some extent, trying to work things out through all the individual personalities and individual differences and unique backgrounds, some Jewish, some you know, uh, Gentile, some kind of a mix, trying to work through what church looks like and yet remain kingdom of God minded. And it wasn't an easy task. Corinth, or just look at the first book of Acts, I, I looked at, I looked at, um, I mean, we write. So the idea is unity in the midst of diversity. So it's unity in the midst of diversity, not losing our identity, not losing who we are, whether we're a large church or a home church or whatever it is, but keeping unity in the midst of diversity. So I look back over 
the Bible that, you know, just the early church, what it looked like. And, and he, unfortunately, left to ourself, we tend to divide. Left to ourself, we tend to find, you know, our differences rather than what unites us. Left to ourself, we kind of tend to lack grace and left to ourself, at least the guys anyway. At least the guys, maybe not the girls. At least the guys, we tend to be what? Competitive, right? Any guys competitive? No guys at all competitive. Wow. How many girls are competitive? All right, all, the girls are the competitive ones. All right. All right. It goes back to that loner guy thing we talked about last week. I'm not answering his question. Who does he think he is? I'm just kidding. Stay with me. Stay with me. So we get out of, out already Ananias, Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. The church is trying to come together and, 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 and unite. And so they're selling some of their stuff to, you know, to help out other people. And so there's this sense of trying to keep unity in the midst of diversity. Ananias and Sapphira get together and they decide they're going to sell their stuff. And so what they do is they come to the church and say, hey, this is everything we sold. This is all the money. We're giving it all to you. The truth is it wasn't. The truth is, is that already they were trying to be competitive. They're already trying to look good in front of their peers. They're already trying to fit in with the crowd. They're already trying to look spiritual. So very early church, you already see things kind of kind of going astray a little bit. You know, in the next chapter, chapter six of Acts talks about two sets of widows and how one set of widows was getting really good treatment. And, you know, they were looking out for them. But the other set of widows was like, not so much. And so Acts chapter 6. And so they have to set up some elders and some deacons to say, come on, let's stay in unity. Let's try to stay together. We see going through the rest of the Bible, uh, Peter <laughs> shortly after shuns non-Jewish believers. You know, he's sitting around with them. And then some of his buddies come in and he gets up and he leaves them and he shuns them. All right. This difficulty and finding unity, and finding one purpose in the midst of diversity. In the midst of diversity. One of the first councils to meet, what they would do is they would, different leaders from different churches would come together and they would kind of gather and they'd work through stuff. One of the first ones we see is in Acts 15. How, how many of you have been saved all oh, within the last five years? You came to Christ. Raise your hands. What would you do? How many of like, you came to Christ the last five years? Yeah. All right, great. So I'm not picking on you, but here we go. When we get saved, how many of you had some kind of preconceived ideas of what truth looked like? Don't raise your hand. So you had some preconceived ideas of what, you know, what this was. This is how my mama did it. My daddy did it. So when Christianity comes into play... You've got people that were like worshiping angels. And so someone comes to Christ and like my dad worshiped angels, my mom worshiped angels, my uncle worshiped angels, we all worship angels. I still worship angels. I just added Jesus to it. And that's the situation in the early church is this, this idea of adding stuff and there's Gnosticism. Gnosticism is essentially this idea that, you know, there's a dichotomy between spiritual and secular, if you will, that the spirit man is, you know, real close to God. Everything flesh can't be of God. And it led to a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of false truths. One of them is, you know, the supernatural knowledge. Only a certain people can get this level of knowledge if they reach this level. And it talked about Jesus not really being flesh because God can't really be with the flesh. And there's all kinds. And so they had to work through some of the stuff. One of the issues they worked through in Acts 15 is, and what are the expectations for new converts? When someone gets saved, should they get circumcised? You know, all the guys are like, no, dude, no. <laughs> Not happening. So that was like a huge question. I'm so glad that they said no. That was a decision, right? Should, you know, what about meat? Can they eat meat? Can they not eat meat? What about days and festivals and celebrations? What do they have to practice? What do they not have to practice? I mean, you kind of get the early church picture. I mean, can you kind of see how difficult it is with all the diversity to try to keep a sense of unity? So councils kind of come on and on and they, and they go forward and they come in response to different teachings and different things that are happening within the church. And around 180 AD, they, they kind of formulate 
the early church, this, this creed, if you will. And, and this creed is kind of a way of trying to keep in the midst of so much diversity a sense of unity, a sense of purpose, a sense of, of oneness, a sense of being united. And so they say this is one of our foundational truths, that you have to believe this. Some things are worth dividing over, but often you know, we can celebrate this. And so they came up with one of the first creeds that came to the church, is known as the Apostles' Creed, they say it's written around, started to be written around 180 A.D. A Nicene Creed came in 325 A.D. later, but let me just read that for you. So this is one of the things that they worked through, and it's interesting. Every line as they worked through this thing had significant meaning because this is what they're dealing with in, in, that, in that time period. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, member of different roles. In Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, was dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of the sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So this idea of let's formulate what we're going to hold to. Let's formulate some truths. Let's formulate some foundational principles. Which was huge. So they all got together, uh, many different leaders. Well, let me just rewind for a moment. Now, what I'm about to talk about is not meant to be divisive. Because for a moment, I'm going to pick on just one group, and then I'm going to pick on us. So hold on, but let's just kind of wrestle through a couple of these issues. Can we do that? One of the common misconceptions is this. I believe in the Holy Spirit, that's not the misconception, but the Holy Catholic Church. The idea of the Holy Catholic Church is not an idea of a Roman Catholic Church. The word for Catholic is universal. The word for holy means separate. And so when the founders came together, really it came out of a guy, a North African Christian, who was debated the question of whether the church was an exclusive set composed of the heroic few, or was it inclusive of all who confessed Jesus Christ? So it was out of this, this combating, trying to fight the idea of exclusivity. It was the idea of trying to say there's not an exclusive one. There's not a certain sect. There's not a certain, this is God's church. There's not a, it was this fighting that, that caused them to put in holy Catholic church. Holy meaning, again, belonging to God. Catholic meaning universal. So if you belong to God, you are part of the Catholic Church. Now stay with me in this thing. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to Protestants a little bit later, so don't leave. <laughs> so Jesus doesn't have one true church. And let me just say this. If anybody comes to you and this, this, they call this a cult. When someone comes to you and says, hey, we have the cornerstone of truth. We have it. Run. Just run. It's a cult. If, if someone says, we, you know, only us and no more, it's we have this cornerstone. We have the, you know, no one else can have room to, to work within that system. It's a dangerous place. Let me, let me continue. So the idea of a Roman Catholic Church being the exclusive group or the one true church doesn't even happen until really late 400 A.D. And so we're going to kind of go through that process. Again, I, I've got many great Roman Catholic friends that love Jesus, love God, so I'm not picking on them. I just, we have to work through the history because we're going to pick on Protestants pretty soon. So prior to... Um, what happened? There was, you know, many churches would get together, work out stuff. Uh, Forty different leaders. You know, Rome had two or three elders. Ephesus had leaders. Uh, Corinth had leaders, and they'd come together and they'd kind of work through stuff as best they could. And one of the issues that arises is this issue of of water baptism. And what had happened was there had been a great persecution that took place, and in this persecution. Uh, you could save your life if you recanted your faith. So someone would get baptized in water, they'd get persecuted, they would say, hey dude, you know, no guns at that time, but we're gonna 
cut your head off if you don't recant Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Some people recanted. Some people said, okay, I'm not a follower. That's, that's the one issue. The other issue that happened was uh, Christianity isn't the only faith or religion that has water baptism as part of its truths. So some people were getting water baptized into different cults. And so that was the other issue. When that person gets baptized into a cult, what if they come to Christ? Do they get rebaptized again into the Christian faith? The other part was the question was someone that recanted of their faith and then repents and says, well, I made a mistake. What was I thinking? They want to come back to the faith. Should they get rebaptized? And this was the question. The two primary, primary people that were working through this question, one by the name is, one's name is uh, Cyprian, who was the main elder in Carthage. And he believed that they could be baptized again or should be baptized again. And again, I don't want to go into all the details of this situation. Stephen was one of the elders, or Stephen was one of the elders of Rome, believed they should not be baptized again. So there's about 40 different leaders from the churches coming together. They decide as a group that indeed they should get baptized or they can, however you want to use the phrase. It, it's, it's, it's falling towards the side of Cyprian from Carthage. The other view, the guy from Rome, this is the first time this text is ever invoked. He pulls up a text after it's already been decided, and here's what he says. Well, you know what? Hey, I was in the line of Peter, Matthew 16, 19, upon this rock I will build my church. So Stephen, Stephen claimed that Jesus said Peter was the start of the church, and so he said, I'm in the line of Peter, so what I have to say should have a little more say. That's the first time that phrase ever comes into play. First time. 382 Damasius, one of the, again, one of the elders of Rome, uses the text as a foundation in which he claims Roman dominance. So he says, hey, there's many, but we have, you know, we're a little bit we're kind of the, the higher because we're lined up with Peter. It's not until 440 or 461, 60 years later, that Leo I believes himself to be the successor of Peter and more than just historically. In quote, he believed that St. Peter himself was speaking in writing through him. So, Here's, let me just read, let me read something. And this, this author, getting to know the church fathers, articulates it again. A very great way. Here, here's, how it, here's how he writes it. Leo the, Leo the Great makes the beginning of a change in the status of the Bishop of Rome. The Roman church has always been respected in early Christian circles, along with other great cities of the empire, such as Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, Ephesus, or Carthage, and shone brightly in a constellation of Christian congregations. Rome was the old empirical capital, the largest and most populous city in the world, the natural place to look for leadership. With its connection to Peter and Paul, its ex reception of appalling letters, long-standing theological orthodoxy in many martyrs, and reputation for piety, Rome could not help but carry weight in the ancient church. But in Leo's time, such informal prestige began to evolve into something more. Playing on the connection with Peter, who ended his life at Rome and whose tomb was still revered, revered there, Leo began to preach sermons and write letters elevating the role of the Pope as the living voice of Peter, to whom Jesus said, you are Peter, on this rock I will build my church. Historically speaking, many scholars consider Leo to be the first identifiable Pope in the strict sense of the world. In his letters, he gave a special connotation to the Latin word Papa, referring it only to himself. Of course, drastic changes did not occur overnight, yet when Leo died in AD 461, he had definitely advanced the position of the Roman pontiff. So there's kind of a history lesson. So we are kind of working together. Rome asserts itself a little bit. Now, what happens next is because of the, because of the power of Constantine getting saved in Rome. Rome becomes a political power to the point where it starts going on that if you don't follow Roman Catholicism, you're excommunicated from the church or you're killed. You're mart martyred, one or the other, or if not both. And so this kind of history happens throughout some hundred years. In the meantime, there are other churches that are formulating. There are other groups. A great book to read is called the Lost History of Christianity, and it talks about some of those other meanings that are still together. But understand, it's difficult to meet when your life's at stake. 
but it's, it's a great read. So during this time, I mean, there's working through some stuff, trying to get through it. Some of the Christians outside of Roman Catholicism are meeting secretly. Um, two people, two reformers, try to really come to mind that, that um, one is John Wycliffe, who many of you guys know, they do the Wycliffe translation, 1320. So we're looking not a whole lot later after this big movement. But Wycliffe comes on and he tries to get the Bible in everyday uh, person's language. The next person who follows Wycliffe is John Huss. Um, John Huss kind of tried to follow his wife because lead John Huss eventually gets excommunicated, excommunicated and burned at the stake. And so, again, working through how we keep unity, how we go through this stuff. In about 1058, about 600 years uh, after the large split, uh, or a large split from Roman Catholicism starts with the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so it's large enough that they're not all going to die. They split. Um, about a thousand years later after that, after many attempts to reform the Roman Catholic Church and bring them back to a sense of unity, the German Reformation starts in the 1500s. So we see Luther as the start of this Reformation. And listen, and it's a good Reformation. It comes within the church. Luther doesn't leave the church. Luther gets expelled or excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. When Luther brings up, and it's a whole group of people, whether it's John Calvin or Ehrlich Zwingli or whoever it is, the Reformations, they start bringing up stuff like the authority of Scripture, the priesthood of the believer, Christ alone, grace alone. And so they start trying to bring the church to the place that it initially was prior to 400 AD. Now, let me just hold on. Because this is where it gets difficult for us. Out of this movement, the Reformation, that was indeed healthy, there's a great strength in that we get back to a really, a, I believe, a, a church that looked like it did when the apostles were here. But what happens is that we also start separating more than ever. If the Roman Catholic Church made a mistake in trying to say that they were the sole authority, the Protestant churches, you and I, make a mistake in that we divide over anything. If they made a mistake in saying, hey, you know what, we're the, we are the church, you have to listen to us, we make a mistake and that over anything that happens, we divide and, and separate and start our own deal. So what happens after this Reformation is you've got great groups coming into play. And they have good truths. People like the Anabaptist movement, who came in and said, listen, it's in insane that an infant is getting baptized. It doesn't even make sense because they can't confess Jesus Christ. What are they getting baptized? What old life is dying? So the Anabaptists come in and they say, you need to get baptized when you believe. And they didn't last real long. Baptists come into play. And they kind of hit emphasize part of this holy movement. They emphasize maybe free will versus unconditional election, whether one can lose salvation or not. So there's different issues they work through, but they kind of come into play. The Episcopal and Anglican Church comes into play. Yeah, they came out of the church in England that was started by the Celtic tribes in the third century. Luther, Lutheran, of course, comes into play based off of Martin Luther's teaching in, in, the, Reforma in the Reformation. The Methodists come into play, founded in the 1700s by John Wesley. Again, out of a major revival, preached on holiness and sanctification, things that the church needed to hear. Presbyterians came into, into play, arose out of John Knox's teaching, who was a great reformer and emphasized the importance of church leadership. And One of the groups that came into play is Pentecostals. This is you and I. The late 1800s, the Holy Spirit has just poured out sovereignly on, on, uh, on really the world and just a, a huge movement. And through this movement, people are being baptized in the Holy Spirit and they're being empowered to be a witness and you know, many are receiving a prayer language and we're believing in healing and, and things just start happening in the Holy Spirit realm that are just like the days of Acts. 
Now what happens is the denominations at that time period say, wait, 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 no way, hold on a minute. This is not happening in my church. So those that kind of helped that started getting removed from their church bodies. And so the Pentecost people started coming together and the Sons of God is one of those groups. They met together and said this, you know what? We're coming together to fight denominationalism. We're coming together to unify about being Pentecostal and about the Holy Spirit moving today. We are cooperative fellowship. We're agreeing to cooperate with one another. The early days of the Assemblies of God was this idea of working together in unity in the midst of diversity, and that's how we started. I'm not sure that's how we are today, neither here nor there. I mean, the deal is, is the Assemblies of God a denomination? I mean, we would say no. I would say if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it might be, you know? But that's not bad. That's not a bad thing because denominations aren't inherently bad. Denominations are, can be very good. For example, denominations help you find what you believe. It helps you articulate your truth. It helps you to know who associate like-minded people. Denominations are good when accountability, like I'm a Sons of God minister, and I will, I will never leave the Sons of God unless they do something really stupid, which you know I don't foresee happening. So I'm going to Sons of God minister. I love the accountability. I love my fellowship. I love what we're doing. This is really cool for you. So if I go off into really crazy places that are just absolutely insane, like, we're in the Assemblies of God Church, which means you get to go to Wisconsin, the district, the Michigan district in Wisconsin, and say, hey, man, Jason's lost his mind. You think I have, but I haven't. But you could say that. You could say he's lost his mind. You guys need to check up on this dude. He's lost it. He's lost it. And they would come in, and they would look, and they would look at the teachings and say, yeah, dude, Jason, what happened? Or, or, or you, what happened to you? You lost your mind, whatever it is. But that's, are you with me? That's healthy. That's one reason why I, I'm not, and I'm just laying everything out. So here we go. That's one reason why I'm not a big fan of non-denominational churches. Because I think it's a healthy. I, I, I think the idea of, of just starting a church and you don't have anybody to kind of oversee you, not really coddle anybody but yourself, I just, to me, it's a very dangerous place. It moves into Without having that accountability layer, some people have accountability and that's what you need. If you're not having some kind of accountability, somebody overseeing you, I think that can be a dangerous place. But let me move on. So they're healthy in that they can bring similar styles. They're healthy in that they help us to formulate who works together. They're healthy, and there's accountability. Denominations are healthy, and that they can rescue wayward pastors and congregations. They become unhealthy when they lead to pride, isolation, arrogance, competitiveness, and a sense that we have the cornerstone of truth. When we celebrate how we're different instead of how we're alike, we have big problems. Let me go back to this question. What religion are you? What religion are you? It's a tough question, isn't it? Let's go back to Jesus' prayer. I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word that they may all be one as you, Father, in me and I in you. That's my heart cry. I want to be a church that's about the kingdom of God. We will always be assembly of God. I love our church. I love the assemblies of God. We will always be assembly of God. But we'll be kingdom of God first. Amen? When people that are not assembly of God or are not Pentecostal do a better job than we are, than we're doing in some areas. Our responsibility is not to compete against what they do. Our responsibility is to come alongside of them and partner with them and be a blessing to the kingdom of God. To be in unity over the essentials 
the things that are foundational to our faith. Listen, there's some things that are worth dividing over. We will hold to the essentials. We'll fight for the essentials. We'll split over the essentials of the faith. Salvation in Christ, the power of the word of God, uh, and the resurrection, eternity. Those are all things that, yes, but there's some things that we simply have to agree to disagree. And, despite our differences, agree that we'll be one in purpose. Amen? Amen? I want to introduce kind of a new, not new, but maybe a little phrase, a, a vision um, deal. I want to be a church that says, you know what, we're about Jesus in the 906. I want to be a church that's about bringing Jesus to the 906, that we, in our area, that we're partnering with people, helping people, we're going to reach people for Jesus' name in our area code. In the world, but definitely in our area code. Because the reality is when I get to heaven, <laughs> Jesus is not going to say, hey, were you assemblies of God? Were you Baptist? Were you Methodist? Were you Presbyterian? Were you Salvation Army? Were you Covenant? I don't know if I missed any there. I'm sure I did, but work with me. He's going to say, did you know Jesus Christ? Did you live for him? That would be the litmus test. Jesus in the 906. Now, new life is on it too because I love our church. <laughs> I'm not apologetic. Of, I really think we're the best church in the UP. I really do. We're not the only church, but I think we're the best. I, I, I really do. I think we have the best people. We have the best leadership team. I think we're just the best church in the UP. So when someone comes to Christ and you know, looking for a place to worship, I'm like, dude, new life. It's a no-brainer, right? right yeah. So it's okay to be proud of your church. I mean, that's yay. But if they're going to a different church that is a biblical-based church, I'm like, you know what? Keep going there, man. God bless you. you know, so right, we're we're okay, right? We're okay. Yeah. So keep going there. But listen, man. If you don't have a church home, oh, new life. Jesus in the 906. So this morning, I have a gift for you. I have a gift. Anybody like gifts? If you have a car, there's two different, two different sticker deals. One is, a, one is a sticker that actually sticks on stuff. And that, so remember, the, remember like the Eskimo signs or the Gladstone school signs, a little E or G or something, and they stick on your window? That's what that sticker is. Some people are like anti-sticker. I'm not printing. Okay, so the other one is a... Peel, what do they call this thing again? Static cling or stick, I don't know. Decal, there's the word I'm thinking of. Decal, it can come off and on. So I'm going to ask you to take, for you that are playing, put them in your car, they're free. We're we'll getting we'll get them to you. Put them in your car. Um, let me help you with the decal. If you decide to use the decal, it won't stay on when it's cold. And FYI, it's cold. So if you warm your car up to a nice roasty, you know, 80 degrees, and then it'll stick to the side window and it won't, it won't come up until you peel it off. Otherwise, you have to wait until it warms up. The decals, I mean, it's like, it's like your license plate, same type of deal. If your window's cold, it's not going to stick. So just, so here, when you leave, don't leave now. But on this door, you have to say decal or sticky. Decal or sticky. Did that work? So he's got both. That door, the door behind you, where cotton's at, decal or sticky, whatever one you want to give them to you. And then there's supposed to be a door over here as well. Who's got this door? Somebody should have that door. Okay. This door right here by the sound booth also has decal or sticky. If you go out this door, you're on your own. <laughs> I'm not responsible for what happens. There are some at the information table if the line is too long. Also... I'm all about the shirt, the little t-shirt, man. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? Anybody want a medium-sized t-shirt, like medium, the medium, right there? All right. So they're, they're so again, Jesus 906, emphasizing the kingdom of God. We love these families of God. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're, we're okay with that. 
So if you see stuff like New Life Church, it doesn't mean we've lost the Assemblies of God name or we're trying to fake anybody out. Sometimes we just need to be reminded that we're first the church, we're second the assemblies. That should be amen. That should be like, whoa, right? We're first the church, capital C, kingdom of God, first the church. And then we're the assemblies. That's okay. Some of you are like old school. Some of you are like, did he just, like, I'm calling the district right now. No, no. <laughs> Not even changing our name. I'm just, work with me on this thing. Let me end in one more reading. I told you I wanted to pick on the Protestants. Did I pick on us enough? Yeah. Yeah, because we divide and divide and divide and divide and divide and divide. Let me just read one last, um, one last letter. And I, I think this author, getting the Re Reformation wrong, does a great job in his concluding statements. Our examination leads to the conclusion that the Reformation was, on one hand, a triumph. It rediscovered and boldly proclaimed the apostolic message, the apostles' message, the Christian gospel. Our considerations also lead, on the other hand, to the conclusion that the Reformation was a tragedy the Christian gospel, divisions among the Protestant reformers, and has mushroomed among their descendants into, to a contrast of the explicit words of Jesus Christ himself. It is at least a horrendous anomaly that the 16th century Reformation got rid of the clutter that obscured the foundation of the Christian faith, only to have Protestants cover that foundation again with the clutter of our own manifold divisions. Wow. That should hurt. That was a knife cut. So I want to encourage you as we close. Fight for unity. Fight for oneness. We love who we are, but we're going to fight for the kingdom of God. It's one of our core values. We're going to partner with people. Amen.